Hello and welcome to Showcase, with a look at Nazi memorabilia, Finnish art and the movies that made the past decade. Should Nazi memorabilia be sold for profit? A Finnish visual artist brings together nature and humanity. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure. I can't just go and we take a look the at the cinematic delights of the 2010s. Oh, The market for Nazi memorabilia is growing fast. A recent auction grabbed hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of Adolf Hitler's most prized possession. Buying and selling Nazi memorabilia is legal but controversial. And we look at whether a moral line should be drawn. Adolf Hitler's top hat, sold for 50,000 euros. The buyer? Swiss Lebanese investor Abdallah Shatila, who says he bought the hat at a Munich auction to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. He has since donated the hat to Israel's official Holocaust memorial. But Shatila was not the only private buyer at the auction, and the rest chose to keep their identity secret. This is not the first time Nazi memorabilia goes under the hammer. But the large number of Nazi artifacts available today and the prices they fetch suggest an unprecedented rise in their demand. Something that raises alarm at a time when far-right politicians and neo-Nazi groups rally around these once derogatory nationalist symbols. These emblems and all these Nazi flags or whatever uh, they uh, they sell or they buy. I mean, it was and, and still is Nazi propaganda. So in, in, in moral and ethical terms, I think it's highly problematic. But there is no denying that Hitler or his evil entourage ever existed. And some argue that trying to conceal objects associated with him risks erasing not only history, but also the evidence that supports it. It is a historical object like any other. The fact that its owner was a mass murderer is undisputed, but the things that belong to him and were part of his environment should not be mythologized by prohibiting their sale today. A lot of Jewish people collect World War II memorabilia. It's very evil items. I'm Jewish. I think it's very heinous, but it is an auction item, it is a memento, it's a piece of memorabilia and a piece of history. There's a kind that it is. But how can we guarantee that Nazi artifacts don't fall into the wrong hands? A handful of private aficionados do make their identities known. Take for example Kevin Wheatcroft a British real estate millionaire who owns over 80 Nazi tanks. Wheatcraft makes no secret of his passion for Nazi objects, and nor should others. If buyers seek anonymity, they likely seek it for a reason. Auction houses, on the other hand, insist the majority of their clientele consists of museums, libraries and state collectors. But if that were true, the market would not have been flooded with counterfeit products, seemingly aimed at novice Nazi sympathizers. One case in point is the trove of Nazi artifacts discovered at a private collector's home in Argentina last year. It was only after the items were donated and exhibited at the Buenos Aires Holocaust Museum that they were found to be fake. All in all, information about both the product and its patrons remains scarce. So, should buyers' identities be revealed? Or could that lead to an even more dangerous trade on the black market? Salome Fansel, TRT World. Alex Benjamin is here with me. He is the Director of Public Affairs of the European Jewish Association. Hi, Alex. So let's start with this. Should buyers' identities be revealed or not? What do you think? Uh, we think that they should. 
Uh, I think it's important that uh, that security uh, services in countries know um, who who is buying this stuff. Uh, um, it's 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 vital that uh, I mean, let's put it this way: if somebody was trying to buy Osama bin Laden's uh, I don't know a cape or, uh, or or something related to him um, uh, or Anders Breivik's uh, toothbrush or something as trivial as this, you, you have to question the motivation as to why somebody would want this stuff. And a lot of the people buying this stuff are doing it because they sympathize or they glorify or they somehow identify with, uh, with Nazism or, uh, or the, what, 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 what happened during that period. Um, and we need to know uh, who these people are because mm -hmm. they, they're potentially a threat to Jews and Jewish communities. Okay, Alex, imagine you know the names of all the buyers. What would you do with that? I mean, what are you going to do with the list? Well, I mean, it, first of all, it wouldn't be a list for us. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've no real interest in that, but it's, it's, a, it's an additional uh, security measure for, for the government. So they should, they should be aware of, uh, of who's buying this stuff. They should be, uh, and not only who's buying this stuff, but uh, why they're buying it, um, uh, and you know, I would want to know. Um, again, to use the uh, Osama bin Laden example, mm. I would want to know why somebody is interested in in uh, in buying their stuff, and uh, and maybe uh, if there is an incident of, of anti-Semitism in a particular area and it's been um, uh, p perpetrated by a neo-Nazi or, or a, a neo-Nazi group, um, it might be useful at least to cross-check against a list of who's been buying uh, mm -hmm. Nazi memorabilia or this kind of a thing. It's, it's, it seems to make sense to us okay. uh, in order to do that. But as, as much as anything, I want to be clear as well, uh, if I may, um, we're trying to discourage it as well. So if people feel shamed, if people feel embarrassed by it, um, um, but, uh, being on the list, then that's a positive thing as well for for. for yeah, because point of view. I think there are a lot of buyers for that people to trade this uh, these this paraphernalia. So, Alex, um, some people say that revealing the names of the buyers can lead to a more dangerous um, trade on the black market. What do you think about that? What do you say to that argument? I, I, again, I just want to be clear. It's not about revealing the names. They shouldn't be like a, a website somewhere where people can see who's bought the stuff. We're just talking about the security apparatus of countries, like uh, police or uh, whatever the, uh, the the Turkish equivalent of MI5 is, or the, where people can, where the security people can know who's bought this stuff. So if somebody buys this stuff. They're automatically registered. It's not like there should be a website somewhere where you can see who's bought this stuff because that, that leads to all kinds of problems in terms of privacy uh, and, 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 and that kind of an issue. But people should be aware and people should know that if they want to buy Nazi paraphernalia, such as Ava Brown's negligee or Hermit Goering's knives and fork sets, that they're going to be on some kind of a watch list. Uh, as to why they want this stuff, mm -hmm. I just want to be clear again. There is, there are legitimate art, uh, uh, items of historical value, uh, for instance, uh, treaties or things that I don't know uh, that, 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 that somehow have a historical uh, uh, meaning. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about trivial items uh, such as you know cigarette cases uh, or helmets. Or, uh, you okay, know, like Alex, I said, so and those trivial memorabilia, what do you suggest we do with that? I mean, sh should we just keep them just to like preserve them historic because they're historically important? Or should we just like burn and get rid of them or something? What are you suggesting? Well, I mean, fr from our point of view, I mean, if people want to have them, then yes, the, the logical place for them is museums. The logical place for them is museums if they have a, some kind of intrinsic value but they shouldn't be available on the on the open market they shouldn't be available for for people who uh, who admire the nazis uh, or who support what they stood for to be able to buy and sort of keep in their mantelpieces uh, you know i mean it's 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 extremely distasteful not only for jewish people but i, I would imagine for yeah. many other millions of people who, who died and and uh, and during the wars that somehow this stuff is 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 trivialized and and sort of these little tidbits of uh, of, uh, of of memorabilia they shouldn't be in the market in the mm. first place i mean auction they're, houses they're, they're... in line with what you're suggesting they insist that the majority of their clients are museums libraries or state collectors but do you believe in this 
I'm, I, I'm not sure. I mean, of course, right now there's no way of knowing, which is why it's a good way of putting the, putting it on a on a uh, on on a security list. I mean, for instance, uh, the guy who bought there uh, was a, a Lebanese businessman, Abdallah Chatila, uh, who bought um, almost uh, six hundred thousand euros worth of his stuff because he, like us, felt. What is this stuff doing in the, in, in the marketplace? You know, if it's for museums, of course, uh, that's that, that's fine, but we need to know. We need to know that it's not going into the wrong hands. So, uh, you know, of course, I say, if there's, if there's a legitimate case for, uh, for uh, something of historical value, but I'm really hard pressed. I'm really hard pressed when I think about it to find why, uh, again, something like Ava Brown's negligee or jewelry belonging to Hermann Goering's wife, how any of this has any historical value. Okay, Alex Benjamin, point made. Thank you so much for joining us today. John Baldassari is remembered as the godfather of conceptual art. Best known for his witty, provocative photo collages, Baldassari died this week at the age of 88. Here's a look back at the legacy he left behind. John Baldessari, the anti-artist, the anarchist of the 1970s art scene. But he gave the art world a massive gift. Truth, he said what many were too afraid to say, that art is boring. And this is how Baldessari's art came to question art itself. I am making art, I am making art, I am making art, I am making art, I am making art. I was getting doubtful that painting equal art and art equal painting. And I began to suspect that art might be more than that. Why do I have to translate this information into painting? Why can't I just use photographs? Why can't language be art? Just text on that canvas. And so, Baldessari made this famous announcement. I will not make any boring art. In a video in which he wrote the phrase repeatedly until the page ran out. And to celebrate the birth of his new definition of art, Baldessari said he cremated all the paintings he ever made. They asked me if I wanted an urn for the ashes, and I hadn't thought about it prior, and I said, well, let me see what you got. And I did uh, actually make some cookies out of them uh, at one point. Only one person that I knew ever ate one. And it was only when Baldessari accepted failure to conform that he achieved success. I would set up a camera on the tripod and carefully frame a shot, and then I would just arbitrarily move the camera over a foot and take the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> but then, of course, any time I had an invitation to show in a photography show, I, I would say no. I just didn't want that label. I really just don't think imagery should be owned, uh, including my own. If it's part of our world, it's like owning words. You know, like, how could you own words? And one day, Baltazari made a simple discovery. Dots. I just had these price stickers I was using for something else in some graphic way, and I put them on all the faces, and I just felt like it leveled a playing field. One of the best compliments I ever got was, John, what I like about your work is what you leave out. Baltazari didn't care about money or fame. To him, art was a means of busting the boundaries of art itself. I can't Im imagine a life without doing art. I mean, I wake up thinking about art, I think about it all day long, and go to sleep at night thinking about art. And in, in the shower, driving, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Salome Fancel, TRT World. Lapland is Finland's northernmost region. It's home to reindeer, wild woods, and a great place to see the northern lights. But one Finn's art shows that the future of this region is in peril. 
Places of Mind, Framed by the World, covers two dozen years in the career of artist Kaya Kuro. The retrospective in the city of Rovaniemi features Kuro sculptures, photographs and installations. They showcase her approach to the changing relationship between nature and man. And for her, nature is more than just an inspiration. It's her art's main resource. She makes her art pieces the same way as the man deals with nature, shaping it, forming it, using it, making something different to make us think. Environmental and spatial art is Kuro's own specialty. She combines traditional techniques with conceptual features. And recent works, including a photographic series that show boundary markers fixed on trees in the conservation area, concern the artist's opposing view to the proposed plans of mining. She doesn't judge. She just shows us the facts, the state of nature at the moment, and how does the man have an effect to the nature. Um, the latest theme has been the mining plans um, to Sodankula area. There is this um, big nature conservation area, nature reservation area, um, that they are planning a mine to. So she, she is against that very strongly, but, but even though her artwork doesn't judge, it, sh it, it shows us the facts. Although she doesn't judge anyone, her works still challenge viewers to consider about how we treat nature as well as our future. We're now through the gates of an exciting new decade. So how did we get here? Let's take a look back at the films of the 2010s. One trend that left its stamp on the 2010s was the superhero comic book adaptation. Fun isn't something one considers when balancing the universe. And Marvel dominated, thanks in due part to its record-breaking, computer-generated, imagery-filled epics featuring highly bankable characters. And a company that once faced bankruptcy became the envy of Hollywood. Could have permanently destroyed everything I've been working on. We, as far as visionary auteur directors in the past decade are concerned, David Fincher led the pack. In addition to lending prestige to Netflix through his hit productions House of Cards and Mindhunter, the California native especially received acclaim for capturing the zeitgeist of the social media craze with the social network. Deserve some recognition from this board. I'm sorry? Yes. I don't understand. Which part? So you guys coming up from the city? Yeah, we're just heading up for the weekend. Can I see your license, please? He wasn't driving. I didn't ask who was driving, I asked to see his ID. Gender and ethnic diversity in genre cinema also shined in the 2010s. And fingers point in the direction of Get Out as the prime example of this movement. African-American filmmaker Jordan Peele took home the best original screenplay Oscar with this interracial drama masquerading as horror. Hypnosis. I'm good, actually. Dear Frodo, you asked me once if I had told you everything there was to know about my adventures. Previously successful franchises were also brought back to life in the past decade, like The Lord of the Rings. Equally mega-budgeted Hobbit trilogy grossed nearly $3 billion at the box office, although it didn't capture a buzz in the media. As Forbes magazine put it, nobody cared, because they lacked the ever-expanding storylines of such spectacles as the Marvel Universe movies. Which comes to show that in the last decade, no matter how epic the story, the press still clamors for reboots, sequels, and spin-offs. Let's turn to film critic Nicholas Barber now. Hi, Nicholas. So you're saying that Hello. 2010s was the most it was a decade that changed cinema forever. I mean, that is a huge thing to say. So would you also say that it was the most important decade for cinema in history? 
Uh, no, I wouldn't say it was the most important decade, but uh, I think um, as far as changes uh, occurring, it was it's definitely up there. It's definitely got to be one of the most uh, significant uh, decades in that sense. But cinema changes all the time, of course. There's all sorts of trends. There's all sorts of uh, new technologies that come along. But the 2010s really, really have stood out. I mean, the main thing is obviously um, <clears throat> is te technological. And uh, technology has changed in all sorts of ways. But streaming has been the big thing. I mean, Netflix, Amazon, they really have changed things. Uh, it's no longer a case of going to a video store or, or uh, buying a DVD or ordering a DVD online. Uh, it's never been easier just to watch a film at home uh, on your TV or your laptop or your phone. Um, because of streaming and it, and it really has transformed things. Partly it's because we can uh, we can expect to watch films at home in a way that we didn't used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't eat, we, but partly it's because these companies are, are also have moved into production. They're actually financing films now. Okay. And, uh, okay, so uh, uh, as you also said, changes come and go. I mean, these kind of like, mm. we, we've all, all seen like all sorts of changes in history. What makes mm. you say that this is going to be, this is changed forever? How do you not, how do you know that we're not going to get rid of Netflix style or streaming style uh, cinematic experience? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I can't predict it. And that's the amazing thing, actually. It is so hard to predict. I mean, I don't think 10 years ago, any of us would have quite known the, uh, the, what changes would have come along. So it is very hard to predict what's going to happen next. Um, it doesn't look as if those things were, will uh, disappear, though. I mean, I, I can only imagine it, it, they'll, um, things will go even further. But yeah, I mean, uh, whether cinemas will survive, I don't know. But certainly streaming really has changed things. And we expect to see films at home now in a much, much quicker way. It's not like waiting for, for, for weeks or months to see a film at home. We're really expecting to see it almost as soon as it's released. Um, and then, as I say, uh, the likes of Netflix and Amazon have started producing their own films. It was only five years ago, 2015, that there was uh, Netflix produced its first film. I mean, that's amazing. It was only five years ago. But now mm -hmm. they, they not only put out a huge number of films, but they've started putting out some very, very acclaimed films, The Irishman, Roma, Marriage Story. So they can claim to be really major uh, yeah. players and can really set, set the... Um, set their own terms about where the films go into cinemas first, whether they go on online first uh, or whether it's, you know, very close. That's all changed. I mean, that mm -hmm. just did, didn't exist at the start of the decade. So that's, sure. that's the big thing. For sure. But uh, Nicholas, sorry to cut you off there, but you <laughs> said in your op-ed and just now that you don't know whether cinema mm. will be around uh, the end of 2020. I mean, that decade. I, I just don't understand this. Like, what do you mean? What is the alternative <laughs> scenario to this? Well, obviously, I hope cinemas um, exist at the end of, of the decade, and, and I assume they will. And cinemas have done an interesting job, actually, of, of changing a, a themselves. I mean, there's things like um, live broadcasts of uh, plays and operas and so on uh, shown in cinemas, and that's become very popular. So cinema has done a very good job of reinventing itself. There's all sorts of little boutique cinemas and so on. So I hope that continues. But more and more people do watch films at home. Their screens at home get bigger, uh, they get better, and, you know, it's obviously a lot cheaper. So, uh, yeah, it's just very, very hard to know uh, where, where it's going to go. But, obviously, I would love it <laughs> if cinema, the cinema experience continues. I still think that is the best way to watch a film. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 that, that has been a big, big change. There have been many other changes this decade as well, actually, but streaming really has been the big one. Nicholas Barber, good to have you on our show today. Thank you. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Our YouTube channel has so much more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we wrap up, let's stop in China's coolest city, which transforms this time of year into a glittering winter wonderland.
One of our design ideas this year is traditional inheritance. You can see the elements of Western classical architectures were blended into our design. 